Welcome, everyone. I am uh, so delighted to have this webcast with you today, not only because we have Mohammed Asaria from Range Development, who is one of the tippy toppest CBI professionals in the world with tremendous experience that you will hear about in the CBI space, um, but also because um, this journey into CBI and E2 um, has been a, 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 just that, a journey for me, because as many of you know, I have been all about EB5 for well over a decade. And um, ironically, it took COVID and it took the changes in EB5 that we're all experiencing and managing uh, to get me to um, look well outside EB5, well outside my comfort zone, expand my horizons, um, and add to my playbook. And um, it was and is amazing what I am finding out there. Um, and so I am really excited to share this part of my experience and journey with you and to introduce you to this part which I think is really one of the most exciting parts of global immigration period worldwide, this um, CBI investment immigration worldwide. Um, and to share with you a little bit about what I'm learning and to introduce you to Mohammed and Range and what this incredible company has been up to in this space. So I'm just gonna give a couple of introductory remarks and then I'm going to introduce you to Mohammed. Um, E2 visas, what is it about? Well, it's an immigration, US immigration investment visa category, but it's much, much more than that. It's about significant foreign direct investment into the United States through our immigration system. In just one fiscal year, we reported 4 trillion in foreign direct investment. This is significant in our economy and at a time we need it most. We've issued over 43,000 E2 visas in one year. And in recognition of the importance of this visa category to our economy, the prior administration exempted the E2 visas under a national interest banner um, for bans that apply to other workhorse visa categories like the H1B. So this is, this is a, a visa of real economic importance to our country. Why is it um, so attractive now? Um, it's been around for decades, but it's very attractive right now to the audience that we and EB5 have been pitching to for the last decade. Some of the reasons is that um, include the fact that there are no limits or quotas on E2 visas. We've been kind of struggling under the, the limit, the visa limits in the EB5 space for some time now. We don't have that in E2s. There's no investment threshold. That's another issue that we've been managing for the last couple of years. There is no jobs requirement. There has to be economic impact, but there is no specific job requirement. Uh, residents uh, in the E2 status can be in the United States in theory indefinitely, as long as their business is operating and their investment remains at risk. And the timing, we know that in EB-5, this is a subject we all complain about and our investors and our clients. It takes a while. It's a, there's a big payoff at the end, no doubt about it, but it's a years long process. Whereas the E-2 is a much, much quicker process. It's, it's a game of months, not years. The one challenge in the E-2 space has been that we have to have a treaty with the country uh, that is sourcing the foreign national investor. And so this has been a barrier to some of the markets where we have a lot of high net worth individual investors who are interested in being mobile and moving to the United States, but we don't have a treaty. These include India, China, um, as just two of the large, Nigeria, South Africa. Um, and this is where CBI, citizenship by investment comes in. This is a way for nationals from those countries, countries with whom we don't have visas, who are interested in being globally mobile, in moving to the United States but can't because we don't have an E2 treaty, acquire that required treaty nationality and thereafter be able to seek an E2 visa to come to the United States. 
So this is where Muhammad and Range and their presence in Grenada uh, come in. And just a really quick word about how I met Muhammad, um, which I think speaks to uh, him and Range developments. Um, I was attending one of these international RCB um, conferences, RBI conferences, excuse me, and the, um, it was very well organized and there were these virtual exhibit halls and we're kind of navigating through them and um, just kind of seeing how this new platform works and scrolling through these exhibits and in the exhibit hall and I came across range developments and played um, his video. And it was immediately obvious that we share the same values in terms of um, real pride in what we have to offer um, and a real focus, a genuine dedication to the experience that our clients and investors are having when they work with us, a dedication and a focus on that experience. Um, and of course, um, the, the, the product itself, the, um, the uh, offering of the investment in their uh, various developments um, was, of course, um, something that um, Muhammad can speak to more directly. And so I, I cold called him. I reached out and we had a wonderful conversation. And um, I uh, was and, and in our conversation, everything that I thought about range and what they seem to represent, um, I found represented in Muhammad. So I think uh, for any of you who will follow up and have conversations with Muhammad and his team at range, I think you will find you will have the same experience as I did and continue to. So with that, Muhammad, tell us about yourself and about range and what you're doing in the CBI space. Sure. For, first of all, let me say good evening to all um, our attendees. Um, pleasure you could all take the time out, out of your days to, to join us. And Carolyn, let me just say thank you for your kind words. You've been very generous with your compliments. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you and your team over the last years. I do remember our first phone call quite well. Um, and you're right, it was at one of these virtual events, and we we're still struggling to make sure the internet wasn't crashing and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, we've come a long way in the virtual world since then. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's been wonderful to, to work with such an experienced practitioner as yourself when it comes to matters in U.S. immigration. And I know our clients really value some of the very well thought out analysis of their situations that you've shared with them, um, which gives them confidence to proceed with the next stage of the journey. Because as you, as you rightly say, we're we're half the solution when it comes to the E2 visa. Um, the other half is finding the right E2 business and structuring the family affairs in the right way to achieve their, to achieve their objectives. And, you know, starting on that basis, whenever I meet a client, the first thing I always ask is, what are you looking to achieve? Just to make sure that our product is right for them. And you know, so many times I've just put my hands up and said, you know what, Grenada E2 isn't for you maybe you know, an, alternative, an alternative US solution is. Um, because Grenada E2 is really Pacific. It's basically a, a business visa. Um, but you know what? I know I'm jumping around in, in terms of our plan. Let me answer, your, let me answer, your, uh, let me answer the question I was asked. So um, I started a company called Range Developments close to a decade ago. Um, I'm a lawyer by training and I realized very early on in my legal career, I wasn't very good at being a lawyer. Um, and I think the, I, I very quickly migrated into the world of investment banking um, and then into real estate development because having been based in Dubai in the last 15 years, I've seen a, a city basically rise out of the desert. Um, and that really provided us the entrepreneurial ambition we needed um, to start my business. Um, our first project in the Caribbean was in the lovely island of St. Kitts. I stumbled across this whole CBI world by pure chance when an individual came to see me in 2012 and suggested I would benefit from having a St. Kitts passport. Um, and through that chance conversation um, and understanding the merits of the St. Kitts proposition, it provides individuals with the ability to travel the world, obtain a second citizenship. And, you know, I live in a, a turbulent or a political cauldron back then in 2012. 
um, you know, it was the Arab Spring and countries were disappearing for want of a better description. People were not only seeking global mobility, they really needed a backup plan. They needed a hedge against that political insecurity, which is plaguing their life. Um, and two weeks after someone tried to pitch a St. Kitts citizenship to me, I found myself in lovely St. Kitts, um, meeting with the government and undertaking due diligence on their program. And Carolyn, believe it or not, St. Kitts was the first country in the modern era to come up with a formal citizenship by investment scheme. Oh, I know that. 1983, when they got independence from the British crown, they realized that, you know, the umbilical cord had been cut and that was great in a whole bunch of fronts, but they also needed to pay the light bill. Mm -hmm. And some very smart individual came up with the concept of monetizing their good diplomatic relations, inviting mm -hmm. foreigners to become citizens of the wonderful Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, and in return, make an investment in the land. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my discussions with the prime minister of St. Kitts, his only regret is that if his predecessor had somehow patented this wonderful concept, St. Kitts would be a very wealthy country <laughs> to um, But in any case, so when on my journey to St. Kitts, when I got to St. Kitts, I found small dwellings being sold for half a million dollars as was the price then. And I sat down with the government and we restructured the program mm -hmm. to facilitate pooling of capital to build assets value. Mm -hmm. And in an island which is blessed with sun and sand and very few other natural resources. Um, in fact, we, we copied from the EB5 model at that stage and used that as our, as our, as our precedent. Um, the pooling of capital to facilitate hotel developments. Um, we have attracted a number of great brands to work with us over the years and Park Hyatt was our first brand in the island of St. Kitts. Um, we opened the Park Hyatt St. Kitts in 2017 to reviews of Best New Hotel in the Caribbean by CNN, one of the top 100 hotels globally by Condé Nast, and showed that with an institutional approach, countries could not only attract citizenship dollars in terms of the fees which come in with an application, but also an institutional asset, which creates significant direct and indirect employment. I mean, over 300 people were at this hotel before COVID, 94% of which were from the island of St. Kitts and Nevis, and probably the same again indirectly. Um, and countries have recognized this. Um, and in 2015, seeking to attract investment to the island of Dominica, I engaged with the government there. And we, again, we restructured the law to facilitate real estate development. Um, and that's how our second project, the Kempinski Dominica was born, which we completed in 2019, similar reviews. Um, and, you know, notwithstanding two of the strongest windstorms this planet has faced, we were not even a day late on our delivery. Um, we are execution first. Um, and you know that's what distinguishes us from our peers. A lot of people think building on a beach is easy. Far mm -hmm. from it, Carolyn. Um, there's no institutional knowledge of how to build a five-star hotel because this is going to be the first hotel to that level in the relevant island. Um, all the items have to be imported. And to build a five-star hotel of this size, it's 200,000 tiny bits of equipment all the way to the large bits from 5,000 different suppliers. That's a logistical nightmare, which we've been able to manage. There's no general contractor, so we have to get really granular. So we've invested and we've got the right development team. And that's why the market trusts us and gravitates towards us because they know that we have the financial and technical experience to execute on our projects. Um, so when when you got started with these earlier projects, you were kind of setting the mold there. There was there were no players who were able to construct projects of this scale and, and quality. How did you do it? How did did you was it a matter of importing that expertise from your other projects and, and your um, uh, from from other places, or how did how did how did you do that? How were you able to execute? Yeah, so there's two there's two partners at range. One is me, um, and I have a business partner, a gentleman who is a few years more senior than me, and has spent about four to five decades on construction sites. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's actually relocated from the UAE to the Caribbean, 
Um, he's been based there for you know the last five or six years, and his destiny is execution. Um, and you know that skill set is invaluable. Um, it, that skill set doesn't exist in the region. Um, and you know I think the fact that he's been able to build two of the finest assets in the Caribbean in his retirement, um, no one's doubting that he's going to make it a hat trick by the end of next year. And we hope to catch up the hope to catch up the COVID delay. I mean, you said there was no one there when we started, but close to a decade on, many people have stood up saying, you know, we're going to build, mm -hmm. but no one's completed yet. Mm -hmm. Starting a project, as you know, with the best of intentions is easy. Everyone can have groundbreakings, but cutting the ribbon and the blood, sweat, tears, and dare I say it, scars, which go into a development process um, is very, very different and very, 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 very difficult than signing a, an initial agreement and cutting some, some uh, having some balloons go off at the beginning. I bet. Mohammed, let's dial back a little bit because I want to assume that our audience knows perhaps very, very little about CBI, what it is, what that's about, the fact that there are um, these programs like the one uh, that you just mentioned for St. Kitts where there um, is an exchange for investment into their country, um, the investors get the nationality of that country. Um, could you, uh, as putting on your professor hat, um, tell our audience a bit about what that is? I mean, this, this is a market for us in EB-5. That is, it's just, it's new to us. We, we, we know very, very little about it. So from that standpoint, tell us what it is and also what, why now? It seems like there's a real explosion of interest in global mobility, in citizenship by investment. So tell us what it is and is there an explosion in demand and, and what explains that? Okay, citizenship by investment at its simplest with the professor hat on as you, as you, as you call it, is an investment in the country in return for a particular amount, which is stipulated in the legislation mm -hmm. and subject to that individual passing the relevant due diligence criteria is rewarded for, is rewarded with citizenship. Um, I don't want anyone to come away from this conversation thinking this is a pay and play scheme, far mm -hmm. from it. Um, you know, a big bundle of documents needs to be submitted to the citizenship by investment unit in Grenada. A private due diligence process is taken with, you know, recognized, you know, due diligence providers, and in addition, a non-civilian due diligence base uh, check is taken, and the latter seems to have more sway than the the former because the latter is is more yeah. stringent. Um, so it is it is not simple. Pay the money, get the passport in three months. There is a there is a process now. Why would someone want citizenship of a small island with 150,000 people coming from Nigeria, India, or Vietnam? And, you know, Carolyn, maybe it's about 30% of the people are looking into an alternative avenue to the United States. But one of the key reasons is it provides a hedge. In the emerging markets, by definition, an individual or an entrepreneur is going to make more money but it's gonna face higher risk, okay? And that risk, be it business risk, political risk, social risk, people being on the streets, may get to a stage in that individual's life where that operating environment is no longer suitable for his business, for his family, or his children to thrive. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it's always prudent to have a backup plan. People have seen, you know, people have seen the benefits of life insurance. People are now seeing the benefits of second citizenship as like an insurance policy, which starts having benefits from the get go. You get the benefit, the peace of mind, which comes from having a, a second citizenship. Because we've all read stories that there's a change of government in country X and there's persecution of you know, the incumbents, friends, even if they haven't done anything wrong, it's a feudal yeah. world we all live in. Um, so that provides the businessman, the entrepreneur, you know, with a level of protection he needs. So, so now, it's it's when we when there's when there are these moments of unrest around the world, that those are the kinds of events that can kick up demand 
for global mobility, at least from those areas experiencing that kind of turbulence. Is that right? Correct. There's typically an inflection mm -hmm. point which gives rise mm -hmm. to high demand. So if you look at the past year, yeah. okay, really what, what I've noticed in the past year is actually a few things. Number one, heightened anxiety, and that's led people to, to come is that, to is that COVID or is that COVID plus other things? Is it primarily the pandemic? Yeah, primarily the pandemic, the lockdown. Some individuals feel that governments have been overreaching. Civil liberties have been, you know, restricted. People are worried that uh, normals aren't going to be returned even after the pandemic has been lifted. Governments, of course, don't like giving up newly found powers anywhere in the world that you are. Um, so, you know, it's a combination of all these factors which have really made the high net worth individual consider their position. Also, a lot of people in various parts of the world found it was easier to travel if they had dual nationality. For example, if you're in Moscow, you weren't able to leave Russia unless you were national of another country. Um, so that wasn't limited to just Russia, but a number of countries around the world place those restrictions. And people don't like being, well, people don't like having their wings clipped. Even if they don't want to travel, they want to have the flexibility to and, travel. And do you, I found this, do you, did you find, or do you find that with COVID, when we've been physically locked down, it's like having those other wings clipped. Even if you, you didn't want, even if you don't want to travel next week, the idea that, there are these other restrictions imposed upon you such that you can't travel for business or other reasons. That, that um, anxiety, as you put it, and, and that sense of feeling constrained seemed to be amplified in COVID. Did you, do you find that? Uh, spot on. I mean, I'm giving you my personal journey here, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that your, your situation is similar to me. I was probably you know, taking two or three flights a week. Um, not that I wanted to go anywhere during the lockdown here. It was only 21 days in the UAE, but I felt very anxious. I couldn't go back to my country of citizenship, which is the UK. Would I ever be able to, you know, would I ever be able to go? Not that I had a need to go, but when you restrict people's yeah. freedom, it creates significant anxiety. Um, and that actually saw a lot of business find its way to us um, because individuals wanted to mitigate that restriction on, on their freedoms, um, have the solution to travel should they need to. Yeah. Um, and the other few things I found apparent over the past few, over the past period, is that, you know, the investment, it's $220,000 plus some government fees, so it comes to about $300,000. The caliber of individual opting for second citizenship you know, the wealth bucket may have gone from a family worth 2 million as, as a minimum to now a family worth 5 million as a minimum and all the way up, okay? And, you know, it's a high net worth and ultra high net worth which are now going for it rather than just the mass affluent. Mm. Uh, you know, the mass affluent may have had cash flow businesses, may have had job insecurities. You know, the ultra high net worth and high net worths have you know, over the past year, increase their share of wealth. Um, the stock market has been kind. Um, as you know, paradoxical as it is, they have more disposable income. And when you have more income, you make such purchases, discretionary or otherwise. Um, and that's been a trend I'm seeing. And this group of people, they want to choose the second citizenship because they've got really good backgrounds. They're clean individuals. Mm -hmm. There's not too many skeletons in those closets. Mm -hmm. They want a country where due diligence is not compromised. So, and Grenada has been singled out, especially by your uh, US ambassador in Barbados, as a country which really undertakes due diligence on the, the individual applicants. Um, they follow the non-civilian checks fully. And as a consequence, Grenada has been known to be the gold standard. We've seen a whole bunch of citizenship programs come under heavy scrutiny in the past 12 months. Cyprus, for instance, the European Union shut it down. Malta, the European Union insisted it was restructured to have a period of residency for 12 to 15 months before a citizenship application could be made. So governments 
have been cracking down or foreign bodies have been cracking down on citizenship programs where due diligence standards are not respected and not adhered to. Mm -hmm. And the ones where, and the countries which have really seen a growth in their numbers are the countries where due diligence is respected. Um, because that also gives the individual comfort that he's going to be a member of a, an elite club, uh -huh. a member of good people and you know individuals like yourself Carolyn who've worked hard for their money done everything the right way they don't want to be a member of a club where some unsavory individuals could have slipped through the net so let's talk about Grenada because Grenada uh, is um, very much uh, up on the tippy top of uh, I don't have the statistics, and maybe you do, Mohammed. Um, but uh, Grenada seems to have this down. Um, so, and of course, that's where Range is operating um, in, with your CBI program. So, um, tell you, you've started to tell us about uh, Grenada vis-a-vis -vis other programs. Um, so. I, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about maybe the, uh, the history of the Grenada program, since I know that you've been involved in its evolution. Um, and uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can start with the juiciest bit, the investment threshold. You, you touched on the 220 um, and all in, it might, uh, it might mean about 300,000 US in terms of the investor's outlay. Now there are different products or different um, levels of investment for Grenada CBI. Why don't we start with that? And then maybe you can, use that to kind of segue into how you've been involved in um, the restructuring of the uh, investment thresholds in Grenada. Sure, so I was, we were invited as a group to do business in Grenada by the government at the end of 2018. Um, I'd been to Grenada in 2013, that was my first visit when they first announced the resurrection of their citizenship program. But you know, every country which gets into the CBI world takes a takes a few years to find their way. And in 2018, faced with the desire to enhance the tourism potential, get some very high-end five-star hotels and attract the capital levels, which you know, Grenada's other neighboring islands was attracted, we engaged with the government of Grenada. At that stage, the price point for investment was $350,000 in an approved project. And all approved projects have some sort of link to the priority sectors. You can't just go and buy an apartment or a piece of land. It has to create employment. And the key priority sector as in everywhere in the Caribbean is tourism. Um, so I sat down with the government and advocated that the price point be lowered to be consistent with the neighboring islands of St. Kitts and Dominica and the other islands where it's 200,000. Um, and the government decided that 220 was the right threshold. They wanted to have a little bit of premium for their, for their product. Um, and the way it works is you make a $220,000 investment that entitles you and your family to become eligible for second citizenship of Grenada. Um, there's government fees based on how many people in your family. So your typical family of four would come to approximately 300,000 exclusive, um, exclusive of attorney's fees. Um, that investment needs to be held for five years following which time it can be sold to another individual who also wishes to obtain second citizenship of Grenada, whilst you and your family retain citizenship in perpetuity and it's, and it's passed on and it's passed on for generations. And, and is there a physical presence requirement at any point in the process? There's no physical presence either to reside or to visit. They get to know you through a desktop due diligence process. Um, it's not like other countries where they want you to come and spend 12 or 18 months. Um, but, you know, in, in full transparency, there's two ways to obtain second citizenship of Grenada. First is through the real estate route. The second is through the non-refundable contribution route, which means making a donation to the government stipulated in the law under Section 10. And the delta between the non-refundable contribution and the real estate option is marginal. It's $50,000. So what, it's 250 versus 300. So what we're saying to investors is, you know, that real estate, that non-refundable contribution route, it's great. But you know what, 
if budget isn't so much of a constraint, spend an extra 50,000, have an asset worth 220, which you can liquidate after five years. So your sunk cost of second citizenship is only $80,000. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm curious too, how much is that a part of your sales strategy when you're talking about this is, I mean, are you thinking, boy, you know, I've got, I've also got to persuade this investor that there's an exit, you know, at the end of five years that they will be able to um, uh, liquidate in some form uh, this investment. Do you, do you find yourself having that conversation as well and thinking about that and, and that economy? Yeah, the smart investor always asks, how do I exit? And he wants to be certain of exit before he enters into a particular investment. So Carolyn, if you look at it, I mean, investing in real estate in, in Grenada is great, but the re let's be honest, the reason we're all congregated here today is not to talk about the merits of a real estate investment, it's about the merits of Grenadian citizenship. So your clients, people, you are, your, your colleagues who are on this line and talking to have already made up that decision that they're gonna proceed with Grenadian citizenship or inclined to proceed down that line. Um, and the minimum cost for them for a family of four is 250,000. We're saying spend an extra 50. If you sell it for 50,000 after five years, you've broken even because you are going to do Grenada citizenship in any case. So if you have an asset for 220, surely you can sell that for an extra 50. You can sell that for 50,000 and break even. If you sell it for 100, you've doubled your money. And if you sell it for 220, it's times by four. What I will say to you is you're basically taking a risk on two things. Our ability to deliver the Six Senses Hotel in Grenada. Site work is already started. It's well underway. There's over 200 people on that site today. We're on track to complete by the end of next year. And we're going to do our best to recover every single day of COVID delay and open on schedule. Um, and the second thing you're taking a punt on is does Grenada retain pole position in the citizenship by investment field. And that depends on them maintaining their due diligence, their price point. And also you need to look at the competitive angle. Will another country come up, which also has E2, which could sell at a lower price? Yeah. But and getting they're cropping an, up, right? They are cropping up. Question, you know, getting for a new country to get an E2 visa treaty, it's not easy, huh? I mean, Grenada was invaded by the United States. So I don't think the US is, is handing out the, the Treaty of Trades and Commerce. There we are like other- to, We don't like to talk about that too much. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, but you know, you are getting other countries in Europe coming. I think you've got Northern, Northern Macedonia or yeah. Northern Moldova. They've announced a citizenship program. It has an E2, but Grenada is tried and tested. Um, and the other thing which is really going for Grenada is the visa-free access to China, mm -hmm. okay? So not only can you go to the UK, not only can you go to the Schengen zone, not only can you go to Russia, but it's one of a handful of countries globally where you can go to China. So you have access to the world's first and second largest economies, China and the United States. I'm not here to say which is the largest and second largest. You please read your newspapers and form your own decision. <laughs> But you have access to the world's three largest trading blocks, the European Union, the USA, China, yeah. um, I think it's, you know, five out of seven of the so G7. How, how would you say these priorities rank in the um, investors with whom you speak in terms of the things that we're talking about, uh, the ability for visa-free travel to these economic centers, um, the... Uh, you know, we haven't talked about this, but you know, the educational opportunities available um, in the residence country, whether it's Grenada or the United States, if they're later pursuing an E2, um, there's tax. I know that neither of us can talk about the tax implications, um, but that is of course a major consideration for high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals and families. So how would, in your experience, how, how do these priorities rank? Sure. So, and I think it's different in each family's case, but the consistent thing is we want a country which is doing its due diligence properly because we want to hold a passport which reflects our status in life. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately we're all judged on lots of things, our name, 
our color, the way we look, our background, our religion, and citizenship is one of those. So when people hear that we're from Grenada, they automatically think we're, you know, we, we mm. the background checks have been done and, you know, we're good people. So that's really important to people. The second reason, and increasingly more so, is taxation. And again, you and me are not tax advisors, but you know, I spend half the half my time talking about tax these days. In that, Grenada doesn't have worldwide income tax. You're taxed only if you live in Grenada or in Grenadian sourced income. Um, as pertains to E2, you're not taxed on your worldwide income unless you're in the US for 122 days, which is a really you know neat advantage, especially for you know a businessman living in whether India, Nigeria, or China or elsewhere who's doing this for his children or a real backup plan, he doesn't want to inadvertently become taxed on his worldwide income in the United States if he were to select another, another visa category and he's not spending any time in the US. That would be very problematic for him. Um, the third reason is, third reason on the tax front is a lot of countries are considering adopting the US model of extraterritorial tax. Um, India, for instance, over the last two yeah. years has really muddied the waters. And if you're living in a zero tax jurisdiction like the GCC today, and you are an Indian national, and there is a slightest of argument that your business is being controlled by India, meaning you may have a subsidiary or a very vague relation to another company in India, that can open up a whole can of worms and mm -hmm. you can be taxed on that on that income you're making outside India. So, you know, it's NRIs, non-resident Indians across the Gulf are gravitating towards Grenadian citizenship, mm -hmm. taking something called an OCI card, Overseas Citizen of India, um, and falling and surrendering their Indian passports and falling outside the ambit of these new tax regulations, um, which, are, which are really concerning people. It's giving people sleepless nights. Um, and why their levels of anxiety, and we keep using the words anxiety, but this is really, yeah. this is really it's as well. hedging against this anxiety. So not only is India learning from the global taxation um, from the United States, there is a very, there is a school of thought which says or thinks that they're also going to introduce an exit tax just like if you were to give your US passport today, I believe you have to pay a 23% net capital gains tax. There is, um, you know, from what, from, from what I've heard informally, the Indian government are actively considering imposing this because what is the point of a citizenship based tax if someone can drive a horse and cart through it by offering second citizenship? So the two unfortunately go hand in hand. So what I'm saying to individuals is, you know you have to do this. If there's such a, a, a cliff in front of you, make sure you don't fall off the road. Take this step now because it'll be a very expensive degree in hindsight if your entire state estate becomes taxed when you give up your home country citizenship, you know, for an individual worth tens of millions of dollars, a $220,000 investment yeah. plus some government fees is a blip compared yeah. to how much tax they would have to pay if right. they haven't done their affairs properly. Gosh, wow, that's heavy. That is a, a quite a heavy development. And Carolyn, I mean, I read, in, I read in Bloomberg a few days ago, Argentina is also contemplating or has introduced a wealth tax of 3%. And apparently Diego Maradona's estate are contesting this, okay, um, whether it applies to his estate. So India is not alone. You're seeing it coming out of South America, jurisdictions yeah. which are closer to you. Yeah. And COVID has created economic damage and it continues to do so. This bill has to be paid for somehow. And there is a lot of resentment to the high net worth individuals today um, because they are in a better off situation than they were 12 months ago. And as elections come up, popularism is not dead by any, by any means, shape or form. I, you know, again, we're not here to talk politics, but it could see a, 
uh, we will see a strong resurgence, how better to win votes than to tax individuals who have done well by others, whilst others have suffered. Um, and second citizenship could be a way to alleviate some of these challenges for high net worth individuals. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, here's, here's my takeaway. My takeaway is as a professional to operate at the level that you are, um, we all need to really be thoughtful and analyze what's happening worldwide and in the markets where we want to play, I think, to the level that you have. And it's, it's obvious that doing that allows you to see patterns and to anticipate and to be able to have these conversations at the level of where the client is where their hopes and dreams are. That's where I kind of always go, but also where their anxieties are. Um, so I imagine that these conversations with your prospective investors are um, in depth, like the one we're having, we're having now. Um, and Helen, from, a, from an EB-5 perspective, you were promoting residency. An individual was retaining his original citizenship and identity. If someone is to give up their home country citizenship, that's a decision which is not to be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. Okay, they've got to know their new country. They've got to trust their advisors. Um, you know, surrendering a Chinese passport or surrendering an Indian passport, you know, it's kind of irrevocable. Yes, you can get it back by going to live in India for three years. Or I'm not sure what the Chinese process are. That's a pretty heavy step to take. And one, again, using the word, it creates anxiety. Um, so a, a family going down this path needs to be totally comfortable. They've chosen the right jurisdiction. They're working with the right people and it's achieving their objectives. Right on, right on. It, it isn't, uh, it is, there's a lot going on. It's a very, very thick soup when thought about in the right way. Um, Let's just talk really briefly, because uh, I do, I, I'm sure we have tons of questions. Um, just tell us real briefly about your role. I mean, so an invest, let's say, um, let's take it from two different perspectives. Let's say, um, let's say our regional center listening into this conversation is interested in um, how they can add to their existing EB-5 portfolio. That's their space. They're super comfortable with it. Um, what are, and, and it, they, these may be more questions for me than I'm happy to go into, but um, how would you approach that? I mean, what's the opportunity as you see it from your perspective for US projects um, who have their investor base? And then I wanna pivot real quick then to, um, you know, what, how would you explain Range's role for investors who are interested in CBI through Grenada. They call you up. Let's assume that they don't know very much about it. How would you explain what you do for them? And, and we can start with the investor, by the way. Whichever. Sure. Investor, investor walks in through our door or finds us on Google somehow or through an intermediary. We will hold that investor's hand until they're issued their citizenship. So working with them to compile the file in conjunction with their their advisors. And Carolyn, to put this into perspective, we've helped close to 5,000 people with their second citizenship journey over the last decade or so. Um, we'll facilitate their investment into our hotel. My job is primarily to get that hotel built on time and to the highest level of, of, of quality. We have, a, we have a greed for quality when it comes to our development. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, each one of our projects surpasses the last in terms of the the output bill because when people visit we want them to feel proud of what they've invested in um, so we facilitate the whole grenada process and we have a very experienced team and i have relationship managers in all sorts of countries with all sorts of language skills and cultural backgrounds um, whilst i've been answering your questions i've forgotten the first part of the question it was, it, was, <laughs> it was what would you say to regional centers who are thinking to themselves, well, this, uh, this is kind of interesting, but how does this play into my thing, into our regional center EB-5 portfolio? Sure, so, you know, about 30% of our clients have a US strategy either now or in the future. Um, as part of the E2, they're required to make an investment in the United States 
in a business. And you know, if you put yourself in put myself put yourself in my shoes, if I needed to do that, I'm sitting in Dubai. I don't know very many people in the United States. I, I would like a ready-made cookie cutter investment to have, be that a franchise or something where someone has put the whole package together, where it's a kind of plug and play E2 solution. Um, and I think promoting that to their existing client base in conjunction with our Grenada offering could be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think you, when we started the conversation, you mentioned that a number of green, um, countries where you'd been promoting EB5 didn't really have treaties with the United States in terms of E2. And in those countries, I think the word is retrogression. There's a long waiting list to obtain your EB5 status. So this could be an intermediate product or an alternative product for those clients who are stuck in the yeah. stuck in the queue. So there's a real business opportunity to structure a combination sale with Grenada and E2. Because as I keep yeah. saying, it's always easier to take a second, have a second transaction with someone if the first one has been a success. Yeah. And you already have clients on your books and on your roster who want to come to the US. Maybe EB5 is now past their affordability level after Mr. Trump's changes to EB5. Um, maybe the waiting list is too long that it becomes redundant for that individual. Grenada E2 is an alternative. Now, it doesn't work for everyone because what's key with the E2 is you have to make an investment in your business. Now, if your business or if your vocation can be structured in a business, that's great. But let's say you've got a husband and wife pair of doctors, very difficult to structure that as a, as a business, unless of course you're setting up a clinic and you have a speciality. Um, so it may not be suitable in all cases, um, but I really think I, I, I'm going to kick us off our, uh, with our Q&A session with this thought. I think you're absolutely right, Mohammed. Um, I think the key to, um, one of the keys to playing into that existing roster of your investors with whom you have already had a successful delivery of your product is, um, reprising that success. Um, and that's one of the things on the project side that I've been most excited about in the CBI and E2 space is playing with um, migrating the EB5 structure into an E2 offering, an E2 project, um, where you can offer the investors this um, replicated experience, something that is familiar to them as EB-5 investors and something that doesn't require as traditional E-2s do um, that day-to-day -day, nine to five, nine to 10, 11, 12, as I know as a startup law firm, um, being at your business and manning and womaning the operations of that business. They're looking, the global citizen of today who's considering CBI and E-2 and potentially as an interim solution as they wait out the backlog in EB-5 is plugging into a, a genuine real investment US opportunity that looks like their EB-5 investment. And that's one of the things on the US project side that I'm most excited about working on. And I'm um, doing that in a number of different exciting spaces that also were um, excluded from EB-5 because of the rules related to EB-5. E2 is much, much more flexible. With that, let's open to Q&A. Are you ready for some questions, Mohammed? No, sure, absolutely. Cool. All right. Um, questions and answer. Would the applicant under an E2 work in the US, i.e. once the applicant has established the business along the lines of the E2 business plan, including creating the contemplated jobs not required for E2s, can the applicant take up employment? Yes, yes. But um, it's the E2 employment. Uh, our visa system is very specific. Your, the conditions of your admission um, it, are tied to the visa category. So when you enter the United States in the E2 visa status, you do have work authorization, but it is with respect to your E2 company. Your spouse, however, has open work authorization 
Therefore, it's a point of strategy to discuss with the client. If you have a client, if you have this, a spouse who is entrepreneurial and is doing lots of different things in lots of different spaces, that's probably not the spouse you want to be the E2 primary applicant. You want the spouse who is going to be ready to direct and develop that E2 company to be the primary E2 applicant. So there is strategy in that decision. Question, if I have a client from South Africa, would, they, would there be a CBI opportunity? Mohammed? Yeah, absolutely. South Africa is a, has a high, we've had a high number of clients from South Africa. There's a lot of political insecurity among certain sectors of the society. Um, it's a wonderful country to live, but I think everyone knows that there will be a challenge in the future and plans need to be in place for that um, should, should those unfortunate events take place. Um, question from my good friend, Ishan. How are your Grenada investments structured? Is it equity or debt? And how much is the typical developer's contribution? Those are great questions. Um, so the question, I'll read it out loud. How are your Grenada investments structured? Is it equity or debt? Um, how much is the typical developer's contribution to the project? What's your, what's your skin in the game? Sure, so first of all, it's structured as a real estate investment trust. Um, and investors are coming on subscribing to the REIT and it's, it's, it's equity um, under, a, under a real estate investment trust structure. So when I started the conversation, I said it's really easy to start a project, but it's very difficult to, or it's, it's much harder to finish one. And the two things which prevent successful completion, one is the lack of technical skill and one is a lack of financial ability or capital to complete that project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we start a project, we ensure that we have the money to finish it, okay? And we have no debt as a company, so it's all equity. And every time that we're selling a, a, a share in the development or a share in the REIT, we're syndicating our equity down. I joke around the office to the team, and I said, look, at the end of the day, if none of you manage to sell any units you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? My son is going to half, own a half hotel. My partner's son is going to own another half hotel. And they might say thank you to us one day. Um, but, you know, that's fortunately or unfortunately not the case. I mean, we're 60% sold today. We've had an 18-month sales cycle so far. So before completion, the, the, the hotel will be fully sold or all the respective units will be fully sold. And we'll retain a 10% interest um, because that's the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, it's equity and we have, we have sufficient resources to ensure completion funding from our own equity. Speaking of taking a page from EB5 project structuring, um, that's typically what uh, projects will want to show as well, that there are, that there is um, assurance of capital in place for completion. So, Mohammed, right. if you ever want to do an EB5 U.S. project, you know who to call, I hope. Karen, um, there's so many clever people in the United States. There's no room for people like me in your industry. Oh, your indi please. You guys have got it down Arms to wide open, I'm telling you. Um, we have another question. With E2 investments in a structured project, similar to an EB5 regional center investment, what will be the minimum size to invest? Is it recoverable investment? Can the E2 investor invest in other projects? These are really, really excellent questions. And I get these questions a lot from um, clients and also from prospective clients. Mohammed, I, I have some thoughts. Do you, do you wanna, do you have thoughts on this? This is more sort of an EB5 E2, but you may have um, experience speaking to this. I mean, I think this is, I'm, I'm happy to share my thoughts. Um, investors typically, I think the, and again, it depends on what they're looking to achieve with the E2. Um, some of them will like to have a larger investment on 100% of it, happy to invest half a million to 750, um, whereas other people will only want to own 50% of the business so they can reduce their investment threshold. Um, you know, it, it depends on each investor's own, own circumstances. As to its recoverability, yeah, all of these, in, all of these investments have you know, exit plans. And that all determines on the viability of the business. They have to do their due diligence and make sure they're investing in the right thing. Um, 
maybe I, I maybe you share your thoughts on on the other point, Carolyn, because I'm not familiar if the EU can invest in other projects. That's a really great question. Yes, um, I believe it can, and it depends on the fund, on the company's business itself. If the business and this, I this is a, um, I I believe this to be true under my reading of the E2 program requirements. Um, if the company's purpose and its business is to make investments then yes, that's what it would do. It would make an investment or a series of investments at once or investments serially. So my answer to that is yes. Um, and in terms of the minimum size to invest, I do get this. Um, some investors are um, more, you know, they have a wider range. Other investors are, you know, I, I just had a consultation the other day where the investor said, I just spent 350 on my Grenada passport. So, so I'm looking for something that is as low as possible and, um, you know, and south, south of 300,000. Um, and so I, um, I am not aware of um, sort of commercial E2 projects and offerings um, that are uh, as low as if, if an investor is looking for something in the 100K range or 150, I, I am not aware of such investment opportunities in the E2 space. That isn't to say they don't exist. Um, I do think that for those investors who are um, price conscious in that sense, I think that there's fantastic opportunities for their own E2 businesses, for their own E2 enterprises, absolutely. Um, the cost of starting a business, probably worldwide, but certainly in the United States, where everything is cloud and um, the infrastructure costs of starting a business are quite low. I think um, depending on the kind of business, I mean, if you're, you know, if what you do is manufacture widgets, then 100,000 is not going to do it because the E2 um, investment threshold requirement hinges on the kind of business. Unlike EB5, it's 900K or 1.8 million, doesn't matter what kind of business. For the E2, the flexibility comes in in the type of business. So if your type of business is, let's say, something very, very service-oriented, consulting, um, specific kind of consulting, I wouldn't advise something as general as just you know consulting, um, then you could have a startup uh, capital requirement that is quite reasonably within the 100K threshold. And um, very often, these are, um, these are professionals, highly skilled, very accomplished in their spheres. And as long as their current employment situation, if they're still working, um, permits them to start this kind of venture, then I think that that is a very viable option. The other point to make on this question is, I, and I get this question a lot as well, um, everybody wants some form of assurance of a return, of course, as to Mohammed, as Mohammed said, the, an exit strategy. It is important to know that the E2 investment though, like the EB5 investment, there are sisters in this respect, um, is an at-risk investment. So there can't be anything written, there can't be anything in the structure of the deal uh, where that return on or of capital is guaranteed. But of course, like in EB5, um, you're not inviting risk, you wanna minimize risk, but that risk has to be there. Okay. As a follow-up question to the South African client, would he need to merge into the E2 visa with a business? And how long can he stay in the US? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the merging into the E2 visa, but Mohammed, would you know? Do you have a guess as to what he might mean? Question is, this is with respect to South Africans, would, um, would South African investor need to merge into the E2 visa with a business? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to really distinguish that an E2 visa is akin to a business visa. It's an entrepreneurial visa. You're granted that visa on the basis of a business plan you submit to the embassy. Correct, Carolyn? Yes, that's correct. Part, that's part of the process. So they go hand in hand. And the renewal of that visa after five years depends on that business still being in existence and still being viable. Um, so really, they... Maurice, they go they go hand in hand, and they're inextricably linked. That's an excellent interpretation of that question, Maurice. If we got that wrong, just send me an email because we're going to probably um, close shop in just a few minutes. And how long can he stay in the U.S.? 
um, as Mohammed alluded to, it can be evergreen. And that is one of the um, lovely benefits of the E2 visa. It is not guaranteed. You have to show the consulate every five years when you renew your visa, five years in most jurisdictions, that your business is still operating. It's an operating business. It's a real business. And that if you're an investor, you are developing and directing that enterprise. Um, and there have been some instances in the history of the E2 program where couples have been um, reinvesting or, or renewing their E2 visas um, and very, very vested in their American E2 company. And um, the consulate has found that they were not sufficiently involved uh, for the E2 visa to be renewed. So there is uh, monitoring involved. One doesn't take it for granted, even though it can be evergreen and renewable. Ah, Mohammed, I knew this would be fun and informative. I think we checked both boxes. Thank you so much. I know it's late in Dubai. Thank you for the invitation. I've certainly found it fun. Um, really great being on this webinar and really great working with you. I hope our audience and attendees also found it as enjoyable as we both did. I hope so too. And um, please uh, stay in touch with us. And um, everyone who's tuned in will get a copy of this recording and also contact information for Mohammed, if I may. Sure, that'll be a pleasure. Thank you, Carolyn, once again. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thank you so much. And thank you to our guests. See you soon.